Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ali Kujuri, and uh, I'm a joint professor at the uh, Engineering uh, Science Department and uh, one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series. Uh, on behalf of the department and the School of Science and Technology, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, ninth uh, lecture, this academic year, and in fact, uh, 96th lecture. Uh, uh, in the series since we started in 2006. Uh, my thanks also go to uh, Eastside Technologies that uh, has been uh, supporting this lecture series since the start. Before I start uh, uh, introducing our guest speaker for today, uh, let me mention that uh, uh, we have ordered the pizza which will arrive at uh, uh, 5.30 right after the lecture. And then also uh, the next uh, uh, lecture in the series uh, is uh, titled What is Signal and Power Integrity in Digital Systems and uh, How It is Changing the World. It is going to be uh, given by Ms. Heidi Barnes, uh, EDSoft EDA, High Speed Digital Worldwide Application Engineer, Keysight Technology. By the way, uh, EE soft uh, stands for electronic engineering software for electronic design automation. So those of you who are not familiar with that, that's, that's something that in fact uh, his, his site is really very good at. The reason that we, we moved the uh, lecture uh, a week uh, earlier uh, is that uh, um, the spring uh, break will be uh, the week of the 16th. And uh, also the, the, the reason that we invited uh, Ms. Heidi Barnes uh, is that uh, this month, as you know, is the uh, Women History Month. And we wanted to acknowledge the department and the school wanted to acknowledge uh, in the women engineers and so on. And uh, she is good at that. Our uh, guest speaker for today is uh, Dr. Robert uh, Sargent, uh, director R&D Optical Security and Performance uh, Products, uh, JDS Unifers. And uh, the title of his talk is uh, Optical Filters and Their Application. Let me mention that uh, uh, this is the third time that I've invited uh, Dr. Sargent uh, because this field is really advancing <coughs> so continuously. And I thought that uh, our students deserve to, to hear of uh, of the uh, advances and so forth. And my, uh, I'm thankful uh, to him. Dr. Sargent received his bachelor's degree in physics from UCS, UC, uh, University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD in optical sciences from the University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. He has been with Oakley since 1989 and JDS Uniface since 2000, service in a uh, serving in a variety of engineering and leadership roles. His work has concentrated on the development of energetic thin field deposition processes and methods of depositing narrowband and precision filters. Over the years, he has enjoyed working with companies and universities to employ filter technology in applications such as optical instrumentations, wavelength division multiplexing for fiber optic telecommunications and consumer electronics. Since 2012, Dr. Sargent's focus has shifted to include the development of optical coatings for document security applications. He is currently the leader, the leader of the uh, next generation products R&D team in JDSU's optical security and performance products group. So here is Dr. Sargent. Thank you, Professor Kajuri. Um, full room today. I think I, I don't think we've had a full room at one of these seminars that I've been giving a talk at before. So this is very exciting, growing, growing up the program a little, I guess. So a little bit about JDSU. Um, Ockley, the company that we originally were here, has about a 60 plus year history, uh, came to this county in the 50s. It was founded by a 
an entrepreneurial fellow named Rolf Ilsley, and uh, who brought the company here in around mid-1950s, and uh, eventually bought a plot of land and grew the company up in southeast, uh, southwest Santa Rosa, and uh, the company still resides there today. In 2000, it was uh, bought by uh, JDS Uniphase, and uh, today we employ about 500 people uh, at the site in Santa Rosa. Uh, we also have a facility, a manufacturing facility in Beijing, China, and, an, and one in Suzhou, China. So um, that's, uh, what else can I say about the company? We hire uh, students from local schools quite a bit. So we hire folks from UC Davis, UC Berkeley, San Luis Obispo, and we have some Sonoma State graduates at the company too in, in engineering. So we, we hire some, some folks from this school as well. Um, so optical coatings, uh, uh, we have a fair amount to, that I'd like to talk about today. Um, one is kind of an introduction to the basics of optical coatings. This is the classics, the part that never changes, okay? Um, applications are the things that change um, uh, and the technology that they're used in and how we make them. Uh, so we'll be spending uh, probably a little more time today talking about that uh, and we focused on these four uh, that we'll get into in some de detail there's there's a lot of different applications for optical coatings uh, beyond these and we'll take a few minutes and conclude so you might we might reasonably begin by asking the question what is an optical coating um, so what always comes to mind for me is a soap bubble other people it's the oil slick in the parking lot after the rainstorm but uh, I like the beauty of the soap bubble a little better. So we'll use that analogy today. Um, as you can see, uh, you see uh, different colors uh, depending on the angle you look at it and where you're looking on the soap bubble. And that's due to the uh, interference effect. That is the primary driver, the technology, if you will, the, the physics behind our optical coating technology. Bubble stuff itself is completely transparent in the jar when you take it out. It's only when you make it into these very thin films that you get these colors. So uh, besides soap bubbles, uh, uh, what are some other examples of optical coatings? Well, some practical examples are anti-reflection coatings. Uh, that's where the, the natural reflection from a glass surface, such as these glasses here, uh, that, that reflect quite a bit of the ambient light, um, are reduced here by placing an anti-reflection coating on both the outer surface and the inner surface of that lens. So you can see this lady here, she's trying to be happy. She's struggling a bit. I mean, she's just, she's just a little happier here when she has these anti-reflection coatings. Now, now here, it's a good idea to have an anti-reflection coating. It reduces the glare. Um, very nice, but it's kind of optional. In some technologies, like camera lenses, where maybe seven, ten elements uh, exist of, of, of different pieces of glass exist in this tube in the barrel of that camera lens. If you didn't cut down those uh, multiple reflections, you, you really get a very bad picture. You get all kinds of multiple reflections at that surface, uh, the surface of the film plane or the digital detector plane. So here it's more of a necessity, whereas here it's kind of a, a nice idea. Another example uh, that I I spent a fair amount of time the last time I came here talking about was uh, is uh, this picture does not do it justice. This is uh, these are 8.3 meter telescope mirror blanks here uh, with optical coatings on them, and this is a superstructure, and this is the roof that moves out of the way. So at night, uh, on top of Mount Graham in Arizona, you can observe uh, stars and and so on. So. Um, the thing about these, uh, this whole super, superstructure is that it exists to support a one ounce optical coating on each of these surfaces. Um, optical coatings are used for many technological applications in display, such as separating light into component colors, and uh, it can be used in reverse to put those component colors back to make white light again, if you like. And many technological applications to filter light, for example, um, the uh, optical analog of an electrical engineering filter is an optical bandpass filter where we're passing a certain uh, range of wavelengths of light very well and then blocking the other wavelengths of light. 
So just some examples to get it started. How does a optical interference filter work or coding work? Well, let's take a look at, at just that thin bubble area and we can imagine uh, we have air on the outside, we have the soapy water bit, and we have air on the inside. And now let's shine some light on that, uh, that optical coating, if you will. <coughs> and of course, some of the light is simply transmitted through uh, the, the bubble. Uh, some of it is reflected back from the front surface, from that front interface, and some is reflected back from the rear interface. And kind of the simplest way to think about how interference coding works is to think about what happens to those reflected waves. If they're in phase with each other, you get constructive interference, and that particular color of light is reinforced, and you see more of that color. If they were to be out of phase, then that one is weakened, and you see less of that color. So it gives us a basic uh, understanding of how uh, these work. Now, when we actually take this to the level of making actual products from these, we we grow very thin layers on top of substrates like glass, and we alternate between different materials, and we can make much more complicated kinds of uh, spectral structures that way. So this is just the simplest idea. So um, we have, of course, in every field, we now have many software tools that help us calculate performances and predict how things are going to work, and even to optimize the performance of, of uh, our structures in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, every every field, and you know optics coatings is no no exception here. So uh, here we have a calculation for our soap bubble example. If if that soap bubble happens to be one quarter wavelength thick at our wavelength of interest, we get a, a performance that peaks out at about eight percent or something and drops off a bit over the visible spectrum, four hundred to seven hundred nanometers. If we make it three quarter waves thick, three times as thick as that particular thickness was, you can see we get a somewhat different structure. And it's through changing the thicknesses and the materials that we um, do the design of our much more complicated optical films uh, that we uh, use in practice. A characteristic of optical coatings that to many at first is not intuitive, it certainly was to me, is that um, at uh, low angles of incidence, you get a, a certain performance that's centered around one wavelength and uh, when you go to a higher angle incidence it actually shifts to a shorter wavelength that performance. I have an example on the next slide. Um, so why is that? Initially you start to think that uh, well this path is certainly shorter than this path that the light has to traverse, right? So it shouldn't it shift to a longer wavelength? Well, it turns out that when you do the math and add that up, you also have to subtract off that little bit because that uh, ray does this other thing. And when you do the math, it does work out that, sure enough, moves to a shorter wavelength. So those are a couple of the main properties. Uh, let's look at a couple more uh, after we take a look at this uh, example showing that. This is for our soap bubble where we're assuming bubble stuff of an uh, index of about 1.3, which is about what bubble stuff is, it turns out. And uh, you can see at zero degrees angle of incidence, shown in blue here, we get one performance. And sure enough, at 45 degrees angle of incidence, it's shifted to this shorter wavelength when we use our calculation program. And same thing happens if we had imaginary bubble stuff that has an, a higher index of refraction. But you'll notice it shifts less, and also there's a lot more reflection, both of these uh, this is about 35% reflection and 10% reflection. So we have a couple of principles. Um, these uh, optical performances shift to shorter wavelengths. We can control it a little bit by using higher indices of refraction. And when we have really high indices of refraction, like the equivalent of flint glasses of, of optical thin films, if you will, uh, we can also make the, the uh, reflectance value go up. So that's kind of summarized here. And so we'll move on to one, uh, one more thing about these thin film structures. There's certain stock structures that we can use to create certain kinds of effects. And one of these is known as a, a Fabry-Perot filter. It's a spacer that's separated by a reflector, uh, a kind of reflector we call a quarter wave stack on each side. And that's this sort of sequence of layers. And this stock, if you will, commonly used kind of structure gives a performance that's shown by this purple um, 
uh, line here on this chart. So you can see it's kind of a lazy sloped filter already, even with just one of these. The analog to this in electrical engineering is the resonator, right? So now we uh, add a cavity to that, and uh, one of these structures is just added again, if you will, and we can get a somewhat tighter uh, structure, a steeper sloped bandpass filter. We keep stacking these up and make a few tweaks to the design. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a three cavity filter, uh, this green curve, and you can see that as we keep going, adding more and more complexity, more layers to this structure, we can get ever steeper, better performing filters. And there's an analog to that in, in other disciplines, I think. So, uh, we've talked about some of the basic characteristics of optical coatings. Now I'd like to move on to talking about how they're made. Most optical coatings are made in physical vapor deposition processes. So the simplest example of that, you could imagine some vacuum system here and uh, uh, a source of high index material. It might get melted or spew out material some way or another. And also another uh, source of material that we'll call a, a different index of refraction, a low index. And we alternate between those after uh, controlling each layer very accurately until we have a sequence of these two materials with very well controlled thicknesses of the layers. That's the secret to making that, for example, fabry perot structure that we just talked about or any of the other kinds of structures that we make to achieve the optical performances that we want to. So um, now how can we create that source of material? There's a number of ways in, in vacuum coating. Uh, one of them is uh, we can put a little bit of the material in a, a little metal boat that we heat to a high temperature, often by running a current through it. We mount these two uh, guys on posts and run uh, just direct current through that, for example, or any kind of current. And, um, and then uh, we actually cause the material to melt and evaporate, or maybe it sublimes directly. It depends somewhat on the material. Now, all materials uh, can't be deposited that way because these boats just can't be heated to a high enough temperature. So what we do in that case is we bombard a, a target of the material with electrons, and then the electrons actually heat that material up, and you, you don't have to heat the whole uh, boat up to the high temperature. You just have to get this little region hot, and then the material vaporizes from there. And uh, I, I just like this picture here. Uh, from uh, this particular website, they, they introduced a little bit of gas into the chamber while they were operating this electron beam gun. And you can see the, the cloud of electrons right there as a, a little white cloud dispersing out and, and heating up the material there. So another um, thing you can do to that uh, kind of process is, is uh, bombard that growing film that you're making with the... Uh, um, with that electron beam gun, for example, or your evaporation source. And uh, that bombardment densifies the coating, which can be uh, very good, as we'll see later when we talk a little bit about microstructure in a minute or two. So uh, often we use argon or oxygen to bombard these growing films with, and it just uh, kind of, you could say, pummels the film, uh, densifying it in that way. And you can make uh, films that are actually as dense as bulk materials, not with the same structure usually, but, but at least as, as dense as, as the bulk materials are. Another method, uh, besides evaporation that we often use, is called sputtering. In, in the case of sputtering, we bombard a, a surface with, uh, again, one of these argon atoms, for example, and what happens is uh, it's a high enough energy bombardment that we actually disrupt the structure and cause some of these atoms of this target material here to be ejected away. And then those are the ones that get captured on our substrate. And so uh, the nice thing about this process is whereas in evaporation our atoms come away from that source with very little energy, uh, in this particular case bombarding with a high energy uh, argon atom, for example, these can come away with a reasonable distribution of energies. In fact, uh, the, the peak energy is several EV, and there's a tail out to some tens of EVs. That's compared with 0.1 EV for an evaporated atom. So 
uh, in this case, you get some of that bombardment that we were talking about earlier without having to have an extra process. It happens naturally in the process, and we can make dense films more easily that way. One nice way to implement um, this sputtering process is uh, through ion beam sputtering, where an ion gun bombards the target and then ejects the atoms that we collect on our substrate. And this was, has been used uh, since about the late 70s, early 80s for laser gyro mirrors, and then it was also used quite a bit during the uh, telecom filter boom when, when uh, about a hundred of these, more than 100 of these systems were sold by, uh, by a particular company, Vico. Another way uh, to implement this sputtering process is to confine a plasma above a target that's negatively charged. So the confinement is done by a magnetron, which this magnetic field confines electrons in this region, and uh, that creates this, uh, this plasma. We have to introduce a certain amount of pressure into the system to enable the plasma to operate, to enable the plasma to uh, be started. And then by holding this at a negative uh, potential, positively charged argon atoms now are the things that are uh, accelerated to the target and eject uh, the atoms. So um, th this shows a picture of a, a partially eroded sputter target just to give you an idea of, of how that plasma is confined more intensely in this ring region here. And you can see it here again in this actual picture through a port window in our vacuum deposition chamber. And you can see uh, the, uh, the plasma uh, going on here. You can't see the uh, deposited material, whether it's evaporation or uh, sputtering. Uh, you can't actually see the materials as they're going. They're atom-sized, atom after all. So um, one example of an implementation of magnetron sputtering is the process that we've developed uh, over kind of the last 10 years at, at JDSU, where we have a, uh, one of these magnetron sputtering cathodes again, a, uh, an anode to create a dedicated circuit, a plasma source to provide auxiliary gases into the system. Uh, the process is, is very high rate, about one nanometer per second is typical, and gives excellent uniformity across these substrates uh, that are located here. Uh, this is a, a double rotation system, so what that means is, in addition to this uh, rotation of the primary plate here, each of these substrates is also rotating around its axis as it's going around here. And that helps us to achieve very good uniformity on our parts. We've uh, de deposited materials like metals and oxides, nitrides, semiconductors. One material that's difficult to do, well, there are many, but fluorides is one that we like to use in optics sometimes that it's difficult to use to uh, deposit in this chamber. One additional uh, thing that we've added to this system is a load lock so that um, we can always keep our main process chamber under vacuum. And so uh, when it's time, uh, one batch of parts is finished and it's time to put in a new batch, uh, we use a load lock to transfer um, uh, substrates uh, out and a new batch of substrates in, and we start again. So just thinking about these vacuum deposition processes in time, uh, this is kind of a little mini history of, of some of these processes. Uh, in 1953, uh, Balsers introduced the first actual commercially available vacuum system. Uh, and this is a picture of it, a bell jar type system. And so you can see the operator here. Uh, in, uh, the technology evolved over years, and by the 1980s, uh, much sturdier systems like this one from Balzers were being built. So the evaporation sources are here. These are two uh, of those electron beam guns we were talking about earlier. Um, and here's a collet that holds the parts up here. Uh, this particular one is a single rotation system in this particular case. Uh, over years, uh, these uh, dual ion beam sputtering systems that we talked about uh, were introduced in the, uh, especially the 80s and 90s. Uh, as well as magnetron systems, uh, such as ones that we introduced at our company and, and are in use in, uh, for, for example, for uh, window glass that, that's coated uh, for uh, architectural applications. Finally, uh, in the 2000s and up to the present, we have the, the, the JDSU UCP1 process that I just described, as well as similar kind of similar processes uh, made by Leibold Optics, for example, 
uh, where they also use a load lock and, and uh, uh, use sputtering to deposit the materials. And this is enabling greater precision in our field. So before we jump into applications, I'd like to just take one more minute and talk about uh, uh, the topic of some of the properties of optical coatings. And a lot of the properties of optical coatings derive from their structure. Um, we talked about the evaporation process and how it's fairly low energy. What that results in is coatings that don't have a, a very dense structure. They have a, a kind of a fibrous or columnar structure like the one you can see here. And um, that has a lot of disadvantages. Uh, it's not very mechanically robust. Uh, water can, uh, moisture from the air can seep in and get trapped in those. And then uh, if that's not bad enough, uh, if it gets hot or you're in the desert, the water can come back out. And what that can do is th cause things to happen like your filter kind of shifts around depending on the humidity uh, and temperature of the atmosphere. And that's something that's not very good for precision applications. Now, um, using these dense processes that we talked about, uh, uh, or energetic film processes like ion-assisted deposition and that sputtering process we, we talked about for a few minutes, you can actually make dense really dense films, and that can be pretty advantageous um, just for the same reasons we talked about. Um, this is a, uh, actually, a, I forgot to correct that, that's a transmission electron micrograph, um, and so this is about something like 100 nanometers, uh, uh, this distance here, by way of a scale. So you can also cannot really see any crystalline structure in these films. Some of the films do exhibit a crystalline structure, but many of them are actually completely amorphous. So one other property of optical coatings to talk about briefly is their stress. So uh, these, these coatings that have this uh, microstructure where they have a lot of voids in them, not always, but often they have a, a tensile stress of corp, uh, that they tend to want to squeeze in if you want to think about it that way. So they have this tensile stress property. And what that does is it tends to bend bow the substrate a little bit uh, in this kind of concave shape. Conversely, when we do all this bombardment and use energetic processes to deposit the coatings, uh, we can actually make them overly dense a bit. And that's pretty common, actually. And what happens is we wind up with a so-called compressive stress and what that does is bows the substrate the other way. Each of these has its problems. Uh, uh, we tend to go for these because at least we don't have that water in and out problem like we were talking about. And we have mechanically very robust films. Uh, but we still often have are left with dealing with this problem of compressive stress in our coatings. Now we're off to talking about some of the applications. Um, I'd like to discourage questions, oh. but from the esteemed Professor Rahimi, Dean Rahimi, of course we will accept the question. Um, just a quick question. Do you monitor the thickness of these thin films in situ, why it's growing or not, and if you do, in which systems? We usually do, and it can be done in a number of ways. One is to have a quartz crystal monitor. Uh, nearby that's collecting some of the material and by the change in mass. Another way is actually by direct optical monitoring of the growing film and then, ooh, I better not fire that too uh, blithely here, um, uh, optical monitoring of the coating while it's being deposited and seeing its performance. We will have time for questions at the end though. I understand 15 minutes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so space. Uh, this is actually one of the early applications of coatings, and in the 50s and 60s, where uh, Ockley back then uh, got made a lot of its early contributions. Um, one of the one of these early app, uh, contributions was uh, devices called solar cell covers and thermal control mirrors. So what's that? Solar cells. Uh, everyone has a feeling for a terrestrial solar cell, I suppose, but in space they're really important because they uh, are usually used as the main source of power for satellites. Um, what what cover these 
uh, transparent glass covers that have a coating on them will do is protect them from ultraviolet light, which will degrade solar cells, especially in the space environment, and also from atomic oxygen, which tends to bombard everything uh, up in, uh, especially in near Earth orbit, but in all orbits, uh, there's a, a little bit of a, a species that are actually attacking the solar cells. So the solar cell covers protect the solar cells. And also, they have that AR coating property, so they let about 4% more light in as an added bonus. So uh, thermal control mirrors and surfaces are a little bit uh, harder to understand, but what they basically are, are they, they look like these surfaces right here on the satellite. And what they allow is uh, light from the sun to be reflected away so as to not heat up the satellite while at the same time allowing the satellite to emit radiation at long wave free, uh, wavelengths like 8, 10, 12 microns so that it doesn't get too, build up too much heat. So it's a, a very uh, important uh, part of controlling the, the satellite's temperature. So a, a natural uh, for coatings, of course, we saw it on one of the earliest slides, is for telescope mirrors. For telescope mirrors in space, every bit is important. It, it turns out that this particular mirror, it's, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but it's a, actually a kind of a paraboloid of revolution. Uh, it's an X-ray telescope mirror in this case. And so uh, it's uh, used at grazing incidents. Uh, the whole thing is about one meter in diameter, but the whole instrument is about 10 meters long. So it's a, a very long kind of telescope. This is the kind of thing that's looking for uh, uh, gamma ray bursters and x-ray bursters in the center of the galaxy and this kind of thing. Uh, it turns out uh, Ockley made those mirrors as it turns out, or I should say made the coatings for those mirrors. Um, of course more traditional uh, regular optical telescope mirrors are, are part of uh, what gets launched into space. Uh, there are a number of filters and we'll talk about these for a couple minutes so I won't dwell on it right now, that go into instruments that are used in, in satellites and uh, spacecraft. And uh, some of those include focal plane filters, order sorting filters, and so on. So let's jump into a few of those uh, uh, applications. One of the inventions by um, Ockley back in the 1960s and 70s were filters that uh, had a performance that varied as a function of position on the filter. The first one was actually called the circular variable filter, where as you changed the azimuth on the circular filter, you would filter out a different wavelength. Uh, the linear variable filter is the one that's kind of come next, and here we're changing the coating thickness as a function of position on the substrate so that in one position you get a shorter wavelength being transmitted, and on the uh, other end, you get a, a longer wavelength that's being transmitted because the whole coating's thicker, basically. And this has been very important for a number of applications, both terrestrial, but it, uh, especially maybe in space. So uh, just wanted to introduce that briefly. This is a, an example of a visible one, just so you can see the, 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 the wavelengths being transmitted, being different as a function of position here. So. Um, how, how can that be used in space? Well, here's, here's an example of, of an instrument that was uh, launched in the 1980s, the GO sounder. So this is a, a, a geosynchronous orbit satellite, the weather satellite that's used to you know, help us understand when the storms are coming and this kind of thing. And uh, this satellite, satellite had a rotating cryo filter that was almost 12 inches in diameter. So it's cryogenically cooled, it's spinning around it's, it's a lot of mass in a spacecraft here. Also, its performance really isn't that good. Um, so this heart of this thing is, is this set of different filters that are mounted. They had to be cut into these arc shapes and mounted into this cryo ring. Um, so it, a lot of weight to have to be lifted up into space, and then performance problems when, the, when that uh, wheel runs into any problems, bear, bearings go out, anything of that sort. So what's a new kind of instrument that can be used to replace that? Well, um, one of these LVFs uh, can really do a nice job there. Instead of having the filter uh, in, in an intermediate location in the system, it can actually be at the focal plane near the detector here. 
So it can be very small, only about half an inch square or less. And so this just shows an example of that little spectrometer on a chip replacing, actually getting better performance than, than this kind of system, but in a very small, lightweight kind of configuration. So this kind of is one of the evolutions of optical filters. Uh, it's pretty interesting, I think. So how are these, uh, what's the evolution of these kind of filters themselves? Um, sometimes, rather than wanting to look at a continuous range of wavelengths, you want to look at three wavelengths or five wavelengths. In that case, uh, the technology that was used was we'd coat each of these filters individually in a filter run and then glue them together, uh, more or less. We call that, uh, to give it a better technology than glue them together, we get called edge bonded filter assemblies. So. Um, in the last 10 years or so, that's given way to actually patterning filters using photolithography type processes uh, onto wafers in a manner that looks like this. I hope you can e see three different colors here. These would be dice then and made into this, you know, many different devices here using this photolithography process. And uh, eventually, Depositing the filters on glass and then bonding them to detectors has been supplanted by actually depositing the filters directly on the detectors themselves. So here you can see an instrument where there's a blue, red, and green band pass as well as an, an IR blocker um, and uh, something like four or five different coatings go into this assembly. Um, again, this cuts down on cost, complexity, makes the system more robust. Uh, so it's a, a way to uh, enhance the space application. So what's uh, a kind of a typical uh, application today? Um, I believe this is a mission OSIRIS-REx is going to launch next year. If I recall correctly, it's going to travel to uh, an asteroid that was uh, created about the same time as the beginning of the solar system about 4.5 billion years ago. And uh, it's going to launch out there, and uh, they're going to grab a little bit of the material and bring it back actually, in 2023. Uh, so this, um, this OVIRS instrument actually uses a series of linear variable filters, and those will be used on a spectrometer that will first look at different ports, parts of the surface to find where they want to land and take a sample. Uh, they want the little probe to land and take a sample uh, to, uh, to bring back. So space. Document security is a, another really important area for optical filters. Um, so let's take a look at what the problem is. In the, in the world of currency, in the case of U.S. currency, it's estimated that about $1 out of $10,000 of value in circulation is, is counterfeit. If there weren't a lot of security types of devices on uh, U.S. notes, that number would be quite a bit higher. Um, so... Uh, in the case of uh, merchandise, goods, uh, materials, uh, it's estimated that counter counterfeiting costs U.S. businesses about $200 billion annually and that about 5 or 7% of world trade is actually in counterfeit goods. So that's, uh, that's another big problem. So both in currency and in goods, we have a, a problem to work on uh, to find ways to uh, prevent counterfeiting. So some technologies that have been developed at Ockley and a, a company called Flex that's very closely associated with Ockley, we're together now as part of JDSU, um, is uh, taking advantage of that property, or sometimes it's not a good thing, where the, the color shifts as a function of angle. Here we actually make use of that property. So uh, we create a structure that, if you want to think of this as bubble stuff, that's not too far off. Um, at, at one angle near normal incidence, we get a spectral curve that looks something like that. And uh, at a, a, a more grazing type of angle, we see a, a color that's uh, shifted to a shorter wavelength. And using that kind of method, uh, it makes it very difficult for someone to just simply photocopy a banknote on a, on a color copier and uh, expect to get a good counterfeit still possible to counterfeit just about anything that we do in currency. It just makes it a lot harder and not worthwhile. They'll go to some other kind of uh, crime that, that pays off more easily, I guess. So this is an example of the US-20, where with the colors in this room, 
I'm not sure if you can see that it, it looks kind of coppery at this angle and kind of a more greenish color at this angle. But um, during the question and answer time and when we're having pizza, perhaps we can get all our 20s out and I'll collect them and then we can, you know, sh I'll show you how it works uh, on your 20s. So, um, so how does this uh, optical variable pigment product get made? We actually use our, our vacuum coating technology again. In this case, though, we use a roll-to-roll -roll vacuum coater instead of uh, like glass substrates and that type of thing. And um, uh, we, we use a web, a plastic web, to capture the material. And we start out with a roll that's something like a kilometer of material and coat that whole thing and wind it up so that at the end, uh, we end up with our product. So imagine this uh, PET, which is usually our substrate with a release layer, and then we coat uh, the structure we want, an absorber, dielectric, and reflector. And then just for good measure, we coat more dielectric and absorber for reasons that will become obvious in a second uh, to create our structure. Then we strip away that uh, material we just coated from the web and break it up into little flakes, grind it up basically. And we end up with flakes that are on the order of about 20 microns in this dimension and about one micron in this dimension. So now comes the question, well, why, uh, if, we, if this is a completely opaque reflector, why did we need to coat uh, both sides of that if the light's gonna be coming from this direction? Well, the reason is, is because we don't know uh, how these pigments are gonna land in the ink in the end. They might end up upside down or right side up. So by doing it on both sides, it works both ways. So that's, that's the reason for it. So then uh, it does get put into a transparent uh, binder, either an in ink in the case of currency or a paint in certain applications. And uh, that's how we use it. So um, pretty good product, optical variable pigment, but uh, what else can we do with this kind of technology? Well, one thing that we could do is if we could align these flakes and make the alignment different at different locations, we could create some really interesting effects. And the way we do that is with uh, OVMP. Instead of optical variable pigment, we insert a magnetic layer into the pigment, into the center there. And what that magnetic layer allows us to do is... Uh, to use magnets on the press where the notes are being printed to align the flakes as they're running through the press. So here's an example of a, of a transparent ink vehicle here and our little flakes. Uh, presto, we add the magnetic field and they're aligned in a certain way. And this is actually a real shape that we use, by the way. And we end up with uh, a structure that uh, looks, gives an effect that looks something like this, where you see a bright bar that moves up and down as we tilt the note. And that's an even more powerful anti-counterfeiting feature because it, it kind of engages you and uh, draws you into the feature, uh, which turns out to be important in anti-counterfeiting. So, so far, about 60 countries have adopted this newer kind of pigment. About 100 countries use our all various types of all our kinds of pigments. So, document security. Moving on to uh, application telecom. So in the case of telecommunications, of course the whole world is, is uh, covered more or less by these fiber optic lines. This is a map from uh, last year, I think, uh, showing some of the submarine cable lines. And if you were to look on the continents, uh, it's even more dense. There's, there's many, many more uh, fiber optic communication links. Uh, throughout the world. So finding ways to more compactly uh, send information down these fiber optic communication links so they don't have to lay more of them is really important. And how, uh, how are filters uh, used in that? We'll get to that in a second. Um, total internal reflection, probably you've uh, been exposed to this, but just in case, uh, this was actually uh, first observed sometime around 1840 in France, it's thought, where uh, uh, this guy, Daniel Daniel Collodin in France uh, shone light through escaping water coming out of this little aperture here and showed that the light would follow the curvature uh, of the water as it came out. And uh, so 150 years of technology later, what do we have? We, 
in, instead of the water, we now have uh, these uh, few silica fibers and, and a whole structure of things. In the case of a, a submarine cable, there's way more stuff protecting those little precious fiber in the center than there is actually of the, of the fibers. So there's, there's quite a structure there. Um, so how are optical coatings used in the network? They're used a, a, a bunch of different ways. We're going to focus on one main one in just a second, but just mention that they're used in transmission, wavelength division multiplexing, and demultiplexing, inside amplifiers and switching. Um, we'll get to uh, one of the main applications in amplifiers in just a second after we talk a little bit about how we can first interface light with the interference filter in fiber optics. Remember, we have that problem of uh, the uh, at different angles of incidence, we get different shifts in the wavelength performance. So when we have lasers that are very closely spaced to one another, they'll smear all out. So we have to make all the light come at the same angle when it's going to interact with our interference filter. So we, we do that by putting a lens there and taking the mode that's coming out of the, the optical fiber and translating that into a, a collimated beam. Uh, we capture some of that light that's transmitted with another fiber coupler and the reflected light similarly. In actual implementation, we use a device called the Grin Lens to do that, but it's basically the same idea. So uh, why have filters been popular uh, for telecommunications, especially kind of starting in the late 80s and 90s? Um, there, it's a very well-qualified, proven, um, it's kind of both an insult and a compliment to be called a mature technology. So it's, it was considered a mature technology and provides all these performance benefits. Uh, this is actually a performance, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, a photo of uh, one of the little couplers that we were talking about that had two ports on one side and one port on the other side, just to give you a, an idea of what it looks like. So we talked about stress encodings and how it can be a problem. In telecom, it's one of the areas where it's been a really, where it can be a really big problem. Well, what we found uh, when we were working on this 10, 15 years ago was uh, that stress in the coating would actually cause the coating to push away from the substrate it was grown on. And, and uh, this is actually a finite element analysis, but you can actually also see it on these coatings. And the one way you can really observe it is by measuring the spectral performance of a filter. Well. Any filter worth its stuff is going to have the same performance wherever you measure it, right? But that's not what we found. We found that in the center, you had one wavelength. And as you move towards the edge of the filter, towards the edge here, it actually shifted to a shorter wavelength. And so you ended up not with what you want, a very precision single wavelength filter. You had a, a smear, if you will. So hopefully an appreciation of how stress can mess things up. Um, Let's talk about that one application now of how optical filters are used in telecom. Um, and this will be on gain flattening filters. Here's our map again of the, of the world. And now imagine that some of these links across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are approaching 10,000 kilometers in length. And um, optical fiber has very low loss, right? 0.1 dB, 0.12 dB per kilometer. But you get to 100 kilometers and you drop down 12, 15 dB, right? So you need to reamplify somehow. How do you do that under the ocean? Well, an all optical amplifier has turned out to be the best solution for that. And so uh, the way that's done is uh, every 60, 80, 100 kilometers or so, uh, there's this loop of fiber uh, that uh, optically builds up the signal um, uh, by about a factor of 10 to 20. Uh, so you start out with this low signal of this wavelength division multiplex band, different signals being transmitted on each of these wavelengths, and it uh, grows up to this. Unfortunately, most of these amplifiers don't amplify evenly, though. Different wavelengths get amplified different amounts. So it turns out the best way to do it is to s just slash it down to the lowest common denominator and make them all the same low value. And initially, that seems unsatisfying, but it, it does turn out to work very well. And so you can, um, uh, if you don't do that, you end up with only a couple of the, the biggest signals. So this turns out to work very well in practice. And uh, in about 15 years ago, uh, there were a number of technologies being tried for this, and optical interference filters turned out to be one of the best ones. Uh, there's a paper that we presented, for example, that talked about this. And uh, nowadays, you can get uh, error functions 
uh, deviations in the channel amplifications of about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, plus or minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 dB. So it, it's a pretty good performing uh, device. This is just a picture of what one of these uh, amplifiers looks like. Now this is a terrestrial one, not one of the undersea ones, but but the, the two, the input and the output fiber goes here. There's a monitor port here, and then the elect, electrical, uh, um, I guess, uh, power source comes in the back. One last application, consumer electronics. Well, we already talked about the famous uh, glasses uh, lenses. Actually, Rolf Ilsley, the founder of the company, back in 1947 and 48, when he was first starting out the company, um, he didn't realize he was going to go into all these technological applications. He actually rode his bicycle around Washington, D.C. to the ophthalmology shops and uh, uh, the optometrists and would drop off and pick up glasses uh, to try and make that into a business. It, it lasted about a year, and then they moved on to other more uh, lucrative areas, but, but they, it was one of the actual early businesses of the company. So as far as legacy products go, during the, the uh, 90s, for example, uh, JDSU made uh, glare-reducing screens for computers. Of course, all that over the years got implemented into the screens themselves, and, and it's no longer a big deal. But back then, it was a pretty nice feature to be able to reduce the glare from your computer screen, those old CRT screens that uh, you guys, I, I don't know, you saw them in the history books maybe, I'm not sure. But. <laughs> Sunglasses was uh, one of the early legacy products. Uh, nowadays it's moving to things like screens, like uh, touch screens and GPS, uh, anti-reflection coatings, and, and uh, also conduct, transparent conductive coatings. Um, this isn't exactly a consumer product, but it's an important one. Uh, transparent conducting coatings are pretty important because they allow you to completely enclose the electronics inside your device. Like in this case, it's a, an Agilent or Keysight type uh, optical spectrum analyzer or something like that. And um, by having a screen that's also conducting, you can connect that um, to your metal box that's completely surrounding your optics inside so that it won't be uh, messed up by external electric signals. So, evolution of uh, sensors and today's uh, devices. Uh, just trying to get across the idea that in the 50s, uh, you know, some of the early first solar cells were made in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and uh, that technology can also, of course, be used to make a photosensor. So you can detect the presence of light and start thinking about how do I get rid of my uh, tube technology that I've been used for detecting light for all those years. So over the years, those have gotten smaller and more functionality has been integrated into them. So instead of just having a single chip that's collecting light and putting it out to two analog leads, you've got whole chips now that detect the little, have multiple detectors on them and send out digital information uh, for today's uh, cell phones and, and various kinds of devices. So. Um, the, the kinds of things those can be used in is for gesture recognition, for optical sensors for cell phones, uh, the newer Google Glass and other wearable technologies, and for gaming applications. We'll talk about that for a minute or two. One of the ways that uh, optical coatings has been able to participate in this revolution is by, again, by patterning the coatings. So You'll remember for space, we did a little bit of pattern coating work as well. But in, in here in consumer electronics, what we can do is um, actually pattern filters. Uh, here initially, what, what we were doing maybe 10 years ago or so is patterning filters on a piece of glass. And then our customers would, would tell us exactly where they wanted those filters. And we'd uh, uh, make them in the right place. Then we'd send that to them, and they'd bond the glass to silicon wafer together. And the filters would be in exactly the right place on top of the detectors where the semiconductor company had made them. So, well, what's going on today, though, is uh, they don't want to do that extra bonding step and have that extra component. What they prefer is to actually send us their semiconductor wafers. They tell us where they want the filters on top of the little detectors that they've made, and then we deposit filters in those locations. And again, it can be five or six different filters that we put on, on, a, on a, any given wafer. So. This technology is accomplished using standard liftoff processes, and we're, we're definitely not the state of the art in that. We, we have uh, the technology of maybe 20 years ago making line widths that are 
uh, microns or tens of microns in size. Uh, so we have, uh, with a typical registration area, error of perhaps plus or minus one micron. So we do the normal uh, photoresist, expose, deposit our filter, and then uh, lift off to, uh, that whole process then leaves our optical filter where we want it, presumably where the, the customer's detector is underneath, for example. So here's actual a picture of some filters we built. Uh, this is a, a filter uh, It's about something like uh, 100 microns squared here. And in this room, because of the light, I'm not sure you can see it, but there's a, 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 a SEM of, of that filter um, kind of looking in the cross-section uh, view. So how do we do this? These pattern encoding steps have to repeated, be repeated as many times as there are filters in the device. So if we need five filters, we need to go through that cycle five times and not make a mistake on any of those five times. So uh, any error problems really build up in this kind of process. So, um, one other application to talk about briefly is uh, gesture recognition. So, uh, in this case, uh, the, the girl here is, is interactively playing this game. I think it might be the, the World Cup soccer game or something that she's playing. Anyway, a laser here uh, sends out a signal uh, out into the room and captures the the light from the laser is reflected off various positions on everything in the room, but in particular the girl here, and it comes uh, back to a detector. Um, now, this, uh, what has to happen at the detector is only the light from this laser needs to be captured. Any room light from these light sources like the lamps and the ambient light from outside and so on has to be completely blocked, and only this near-infrared laser diode uh, can come back. Um, because we don't know where she's going to be in the room, she might be, you know, over on this side or way over here somewhere. We have to have a pretty wide angle of acceptance, uh, which is bad for that angle shift effect, right? Uh, so we have to find solutions for that. And then finally, there's manufacturing variation of all the components that has to be accounted for. But um, this is uh, this is growing in acceptance beyond uh, entertaining uh, this kind of entertainment and gaming application. Um, it's thought that maybe one day the way you interact with your computer will be to, uh, I don't know, snap your finger or wave your hand, and that's how, instead of using a mouse and other kinds of uh, devices like that, you'll be, you'll be doing something like that. So, um, one of the important things that we talked about is that angle shift problem and having wide angles of acceptance in a room. Uh, one of the things we've done is develop filters that have performance more like this red filter that have much less angle shift so that we can um, avoid that problem, so that the filter shifts much less as a function of angle. And that allows for uh, uh, main things, probably improved signal to noise ratio by 30% or more. So off to the races, I mean the conclusion. Um, I hope I've convinced you that there are many applications for optical coatings. These applications drive our technology. Uh, we talked about applications in space like the OSIRIS-REx mission and other missions, uh, protecting uh, documents uh, like currencies from counterfeiting, uh, various applications in telecommunications, especially that gain flattening filter one we talked about, and uh, various consumer electronic applications like um, just recognition in cell phones and other mobile devices. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. And it's time for questions. Yeah. Uh, two uh, short questions. First of all, the device that detects the counterfeiting of the banknotes basically just works on the detection of the thing. What? How does it work? The device for the for banknotes? Yeah, yeah. Well, it turns out I have a sample right here. That I can show you. Okay, hey, so, today. Oh, wait, everyone's supposed to. The $20 bills need to come to the front. <laughs> and it's not, so, and it's not so, so here's the yeah. so 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 yeah. yeah. So when you look at it, yeah. normal yeah. incidents. Yeah. So the idea is that at point of sale, uh, if you're the cash register person, then you do. Yeah. Okay, this is like. And then you'll find out. Okay.
It's, it's called an overt function. Do you allow two questions? Of course, of course. Uh, this is a uh, electrical engineering group here, all students, and they will be graduating, some of them very soon, and some of them next year and the following year. What what kind of a job is there in JDSU or Oakley in Santa Rosa waiting for them to apply? There's two main kinds of jobs. Um, the one we more commonly hire for is a process engineering job. So um, it's um, a job where we take electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, sometimes chemical engineers, and train them all about our processes. They get to build upon their mechanical engineering or electrical engineering uh, basis, but they're not exactly becoming electrical engineers. So it appeals to some folks and not to others. So they get if trained. you really want to be a hardcore electrical engineer, it's probably not your best job uh, for you. But, but we do have a, um, the last electrical engineering uh, that we hired for, uh, for this kind of process engineering role was actually from UC Santa Cruz, and he's now been with the company for four years, and he's uh, a, a strong contributor of doing the design of our codings, the sequence of layers that we need to obtain performances, and understanding the problems, troubleshooting, improving uh, processes and materials, and so on. The other job, about once every four or six years, we actually do hire an electrical engineer to do electrical engineering work. Uh, probably less common. We buy a lot of our equipment, and we also tailor it at our site. So some of the work around the tailoring of the equipment is done by in-house personnel, including uh, a few electrical engineers that we have on staff. Uh, can I ask another question? Of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, some of these, uh, uh, shall we say, glasses around the buildings, they are unidirectional. I mean, in one direction, basically. In other words, people cannot see inside, whereas when you are inside, you can see outside. Can you briefly just say how they work? I mean, yes, they absolutely can. So it's actually an illusion, by the way. Right, yeah, you yeah. think that that's what's going on. Okay. But in, in actual fact, what's going on is you have a, say, a partially silvered mirror. Right. Um, uh, and what's happening is when the light is bright on this side of that mirror, uh, a lot of light is reflected from that mirror, and so it competes very poorly with the light coming from this dark room on the other side, this relatively dark area. However, have you ever been, uh, like by our plant, for example, at night, or probably in the buildings here at, at Sonoma State, um, the opposite thing happens, because now maybe you have a little, hardly any light on the outside yeah, here, but now you've got those fluorescent <laughs> tubes that are pumping light pretty good. So now when you're inside, you don't see outside so well. You see the reflection of yourself. So you might be um, doing something a little embarrassing um, in here, but not thinking about it. But these people out here can see everything you're doing. So, so that's how these so-called one-way mirrors work, is you have darkness on one side and bright illumination on the other. Yes? Uh, with regard to evaporating or sputtering films, do you heat the substrate to help compensate for the stresses that are built up? It, it's usually not to uh, compensate for the stresses, but we do heat them. It's for a different reason, though. And it, it's, it's because it's been found that when you elevate the substrate temperature to a few hundred degrees or 300 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. it, it sticks a little better and also improves the density of the coating and robustness of the coating. However, we don't always get to do that because like the polymer web, for example, that we that I described, you can't raise the substrate temperature too high on that one. So we, we do what we can with substrate temperature. We, when we can get away with it, we use it. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yes? On some of your uh, higher end products, like say a, a short pass filter, what's the optical density of the stop band? How steep is the transition? Um, we've made filters that go to more than OD6 uh, in two or three nanometers, kind of in the visible, like 500 nanometers. So that's uh, that would be a coating that's 
maybe 40 micrometers thick. It might have a 500, 1,000 layers. So it's a pretty, pretty complex coating. But yeah, we can we can do pretty steep transitions in that way. Yeah, for like Raman spectroscopy is one of the areas that uh, where they find that kind of filter uh, interesting. In the case of large telescope mirrors or lenses for refractive telescopes or reflection, do they send it to you to code? Or you guys go over there to wherever they are to do the code? Right. Really great question. So in the case of that uh, X-ray telescope mirror, that a special kind of space mirror that needs really special attention, and it's a big NASA-funded program. The mirrors were actually made, I think, back east, uh, Hughes-Danbury Optical Systems, if I recall correctly. And, um, and then they were brought to our facility, and we coded them at our facility, and then we shipped them back to another location yet for assembly into the final system. But most telescopes, uh, terrestrial telescopes, uh, they can't send their uh, mirrors to us. So there are a number of companies that provide deposition equipment. And one thing that they do nowadays, actually, is they actually mount the big 8.3 meter, for example, mirror in a half a vacuum shell. And then what they do is, uh, when it's time to recode it, they, uh, th there's a picture on the web. If you look up Mount Graham telescope, uh, binocular telescope, there's a guy with a broom and sodium hydroxide like sweeping off the old coating, just just walking on it. And, well, I mean, he has clean room boobies or something. Like that. And and then hose hose it down, probably with deionized water, I suppose. But still, hose it down, and then they dry it off and they put it the other half of the vacuum shell on top of it, and then they sputter a new coating on it. And then they remove it and then put it back in the telescope in the same way it was. So they do it on top of the mountain nowadays. Yeah. And the companies that sell equipment to do that. Yes? What's your favorite product that you've worked on? Oh, probably the telecommunications filters uh, when we were making the wavelength division multiplexing filters. There were a lot of technical challenges and uh, it was a very exciting time. Uh, there were, let's say, economic benefits to be reaped as well as technological satisfaction uh, gains to be made so it was a it was a pretty fun project well if, okay. if that's it yeah. perhaps we can okay. uh, now, uh, you have an one little announcement <laughs> the person that robert mentioned rob ilsley the founder of oakley there is a laboratory the other side, his name is on there. That laboratory was donated to us, the equipment and everything, by JBSU. So there is a history there. Uh, now the pizza is here, and I really learned a lot uh, from uh, what he talked about. And so it was really, I, mean, I, I enjoyed it. It was very interesting. I saw him, and I bet you did. So let's uh, thank him for coming over here.